Yo to everyone, and welcome to our online discussion with an expert panel on tsunami this evening. My name is Daniel Neely, and I'm part of the team at the Wellington Region Emergency Management Office, also known as REMO. Tonight, we are going to be discussing the science behind tsunami and how all of us can be better prepared and understand those risks a little bit better. We have a great group of speakers tonight here with us um, who is going to talk. Each speaker is going to be talking uh, for a short period of time, providing some insights, and then there's going to be a Q&A session afterwards. During the talk, please post any questions you have in the comment sections, and our panelists will answer them at the end of the session. Um, I'll introduce uh, each of our panelists, um, starting with Dr. Graham Leonard, a senior scientist at GNS Science. He's going to talk about the sources of tsunami, um, tsunami warnings, evacuation zones, and some research from overseas. Also on the line is Ian Daw. It looks like he's at the beach. Uh, Dr. Ian Daw is a senior natural uh, hazard analyst and science communicator at Greater Wellington Regional Council. He's going to be talking about the impacts of tsunami and the, some of the local and recent historical events around that type of hazard. We've also got Kate Borson online. Kate is the project leader at East Coast Life at the Boundary, and she's going to be sharing stories from uh, here in New Zealand as well as Japan to illustrate how schools can become tsunami safer with the help of everyone in their community. And finally, Caroline Dew, CEO of Alfaro. Uh, Caroline's gonna be talking about the new Tsunami Ready app as a tool to help people practice tsunami drills in their home or their work or places that they might frequent near the coast. And I'm gonna wrap up with uh, what you can do with some simple steps on being better tsunami prepared. So I'll turn it over to our very first panelist. Welcome, Dr. Graham Leonard. I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Dan. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join with us this evening. Uh, I work at GNS Science in uh, volcano and tsunami mapping and warning systems research. Uh, GNS is the Crown Research Institute that runs the GeoNet program, which you, you might know better by name. Uh, as Dan said, I'm going to talk a little bit about where tsunami come from and how they, how they come, might arrive and how big they might be in New Zealand and what kinds of warnings there are for those tsunami and a few things we've learned from studying tsunami around the country. And I'll try and keep it brief so we've got plenty of time for, time for questions later on. Uh, so tsunami in general are any disturbance in the water uh, that causes uh, the whole water column to, to move around and run outside. So it can happen in a lake and it can happen in the ocean. And the most common causes are from earthquakes, or from volcanoes, where parts of the volcano fall off into the ocean, or from landslides, where you have a landslide into the ocean or, or underwater, uh, and sometimes from things like meteorites, although large ones from that are, um, are really big, really uncommon. The most common source for New Zealand, especially for our larger tsunami that we're, we're concerned about, come from earthquakes. And most earthquakes uh, generating tsunami around the planet come from the ring of fire all the way around the Pacific. So New Zealand sits on the ring of fire, just like Japan and North America and right around through South America. That's a place where the Pacific plate is pushing into the other tectonic plates around the edge of the ocean. It's pushing into the Australian plate uh, at New Zealand. New Zealand's North Island sits on the Australian plate. And in places like that, lots of stress builds up over hundreds or even thousands of years like this. And when the ground can't hold it anymore, suddenly it breaks in an earthquake. And it's that breaking and the seabed suddenly moving and all the water above it moving at the same time and then having to level itself back out, that is the tsunami. Uh, that water can be pushed up or pushed down depending on which bit of the ground has moved under the ocean in that earthquake. And then it levels itself out across the whole ocean over time. So that means we can see tsunami in New Zealand from all of those ring of fire sources around the Pacific. We break it up into distant sources, regional sources and local. So distant being more than three hours away, like South America, which is more like 12 or more hours away, or North America or even Japan. Quite a lot of time for the tsunami to get here, and they can be quite destructive. And because there's so much Pacific to send those from, they're, pop, they're, they're commonly the most frequent tsunami we see. But we can get bigger tsunami from regional sources at the kind of one to three hours of travel time away. That's the Samoa, Tonga, uh, or from the under, underwater fault lines between us and Tonga distance. And then we've got sources within one hour of travel time from New Zealand, and we call those our local sources. And 
there are different warnings available from those different distances because of how far away the earthquake is and then and therefore how much ground shaking we might be able to see here or with with instruments around the Pacific. So the most important thing I'd like you to take away from me tonight is that your fastest warning and the warning for the potentially the biggest tsunami and the, the most uh, quickly arriving tsunami might be from that local source and that's the long or strong earthquake, an earthquake longer than a minute or hard to stand up in. And every minute counts when you felt that. So you need to just evacuate immediately and not wait for anything. That's, that's that local source where the earthquake is happening close enough to us that we feel it and, it and it'll probably wake us up in the night. Now, further away at those regional sources and out to the distant sources, the regional sources, we might not feel it enough to notice or it might not be enough to wake us up. So we've got sensor systems, uh, we've got uh, seismometers in New Zealand and around the Pacific to pick up the earthquake. Uh, we've got wave gauges around the coast to pick up the tsunami. We've got dart boards that can actually weigh the ocean and tell us uh, if a tsunami's come over. And through the GeoNet program and with partners at EQC and NEMA and, and civil defense, we help to um, say if there may be a tsunami coming and you can get a warning. And that might be through an emergency mobile alert like you see on your phone. That's that, that loud noise that, that can wake you up and give you a message. Uh, or it might be through other local systems like the Red Cross Hazard app, for example, if you, if you don't have mobile coverage, but you have Wi-Fi, for example. Uh, and then distant source, it's the same warning systems, but with more time. And we're using distant wave gauges, distant dark boys, and diff distant seismometer data to tell us if a tsunami has been generated. So again, you've got that distant through local source, the most important warning is that long or strong earthquake because that's that local source with the least amount of travel time. In terms of evacuation, we work with civil defense, like the folks on the call here, to set up evacuation maps. Those evacuation maps have been calculated to allow for all the tsunami from all those sources. In that long or strong earthquake, you need to evacuate all zones on an evacuation map and get past the blue line where it's painted, painted in some parts of Wellington because that goes around all the zones. If there's more time, like the tsunami is coming from South America, civil defense might tell you which zone to evacuate. If you don't know, don't wait and evacuate all zones. Now, I've been to a lot of places with other scientists to study behavior and warnings. And I'd like to mention a few things we've learned from America and from Indonesia learned that evacuation is everything. And uh, the best way to practice and be ready for that is to run exercises and drills. So please participate in yearly uh, exercises and drills when you see them like Tsunami Hikoi. Uh, work we've done in Indonesia shows us how important that long or strong get gone message is. We know in the Indian Ocean tsunami, people were able to evacuate uh, from traditional knowledge from hundreds of years before, knowing that that earthquake might be the only warning. And then the last thing I'll mention before I pass on to the next person is Japan. So I went with one of my PhD students straight after the uh, East Japan earthquake and tsunami. And we interviewed the emergency managers in the seven hardest hit communities to ask what happened. And we said at the end of our interviews, what do you most want us to take back and tell people in New Zealand from your experiences? And they were quite consistent. They said, don't drive. If you are in a, a tsunami evacuation, you're gonna have traffic jams. Your fastest option is on foot or on bike. They have a concept called tsunami tendenko, tsunami everyone for themselves. That sounds harsh, but what it means is don't go into the evacuation zone to your kid's school to get them or to an old folks home. You need to be sure that they've got a good evacuation plan ahead of time so you're not tempted to do that to put yourself at risk. People died in Japan from that. And then um, the last thing that, that we got from Japan is the importance again, as I said from the other places of that long or strong get gone message. Even though they have high tech warning systems for sources from further away, don't wait for those. If you feel a, an earthquake longer than a minute or hard to stand up, evacuate immediately. Every minute and every meter counts. Don't wait for anything. Thanks, Thanks. Dan. Thank you, Graham. Got a quick question from Lisa Bradley who asks, how many kilometers a tsunami can travel down river? For example, in the Hutt River here in Wellington. Right, well, Wellington, um, at least at the open coast, is quite similar to the distances we saw in Japan. Uh, in the biggest tsunami, unfortunately, many kilometers up a river. But don't worry, the evacuation zones calculated in the Wellington region allow for that ability for tsunami to go up rivers further than they would go across land. land. So that's accommodated in the blue lines and in the evacuation zones. 
And you can find those evacuation zones on our website at getprepared.nz. And uh, I think that's a nice segue uh, to hand it over to Dr. Ian Daw, who's going to talk a little bit <clears throat> now around some of the work around impacts of tsunami and local and recent historical events. Got okay, so thank you, Dan. I'm going to share my screen. A lot of what I'll talk about is a lot easier to explain in pictures. So I'll just fire this up. Uh, so as Dan said, I, um, my name is Ian Dorr. I work at Greater Wellington Regional Council, and a big part of my job is understanding our hazards and the risks that they pose to us. So one of the parts of my work involves understanding tsunami hazards, and I've worked with GNS Science to model how tsunami may affect our region and help produce those tsunami evacuation maps of three zone colours that we've seen in the last few years. So as Graham mentioned, New Zealand sits on the Australian and the Pacific Plate, the intersection between those two, two of the biggest tectonic plates in the world, and they, um, beneath us, uh, are subducting one under the other, the Pacific underneath the Australian plate. And that particular subduction zone has the potential to generate large tsunami for us in the Wellington region. But on top of that, the stresses created by that tectonic collision generates a lot of faults which run through our region, like the Wellington Fault. Some of these run into Cook Strait and also have the potential to generate tsunami such as the big Wairarapa Fault, which ruptured in 1855 and created quite a large local tsunami up to 10 metres high in Palace of Bay. So when a, when a tsunami is generated um, in the ocean, they're quite low and small. You wouldn't really notice them if you were in a ship. Some of the measurements from the big 2004 Indonesian tsunami showed that the wave heights measured in the deep ocean were only about a metre high. They are extremely long, around 500 kilometres long, and moving extremely quickly, 700 kilometres an hour with what they were measured at, and it's not uncommon for the for tsunami waves to be six to 800 kilometres an hour, which means they move very, very quickly. But they're also very large and have a huge amount of energy, so big, in fact, that they can feel the sea floor, um, and they can start to refract around islands, bend around the sides of continents, um, and the image in the top right hand corner there shows a, a model snapshot from a tsunami that occurred in the Solomon Islands. And it just shows the complex interaction of that wave as it starts to spread out from the epicenter. As those waves interact with the seabed and start to wrap around islands and continents, they start to um, slow down because of the friction that's generated in that. And as they do so, they start to increase in height. So whilst they may be quite small in the open ocean, as that tsunami comes on shore, it increases in height quite dramatically. But it also slows down. So they're not coming on shore at seven or 800 kilometers an hour, they'll be slowing right down. But this creates complex interactions. So often in a tsunami event, we're wondering why the, the scientists aren't modeling these quick enough and generating exact wave heights that are shore. It can be very complicated modeling how that may impact. And as an example of that, the bottom right image shows a snapshot from the Indonesian Indian Ocean tsunami. Uh, and that shows that whilst there was a, a large pulse of energy that went across the Indian Ocean, some of it was directed down into the Southern Ocean and onto Antarctica. And in New Zealand, we actually registered that tsunami first in Fiordland and coming up from the South Island rather than from the North. That's because that wave had bounced off Antarctica and had refracted around the south coast of Australia and into the Tasman Sea. So some of the tsunami impacts when that wave comes on shore is that it's, it's not really always a breaking wave like the swell waves that you see down at the coast. Rather, it's a large bore of water that just rapidly runs on shore. And that can be moving very, very fast. 30 to 70 kilometers an hour, certainly much faster than what you'll be running at. Um, but of course, you've got time in advance, um, usually, um, that there may be an event happening, which is why we have that messaging of getting out as soon as you can. 
a lot of damage is caused um, by debris that's entrained in the water rather than the water itself. So a cubic metre of water weighs one tonne, and when that's moving at 30 odd kilometres an hour, that can cause uh, a lot of scouring, it can rip up a lot of material, um, it picks up all sorts of debris in that flow, and it, that, that debris can act like a battering ram against infrastructure, buildings, and so on. So a block of concrete sitting um, on the ground might weigh two and a half tonnes, but in seawater, that can weigh 40% less. And when there's a lot of debris entrained in the water, the, the density of that water is even less. And so large rocks and material like that can um, inexplicably be moved in the water flow, which, which defies, um, defies your, <laughs> your normal reality. Um, it can often cause fires, which seems a bit contradictory, but when you have gas lines, fuel tanks and the like, uh, which get ruptured, they can be, uh, a spark can trigger that to catch fire. And there's an image there from the Japanese 2011 event, um, which shows a house on fire there. Obviously a lot of trauma and injuries and loss of life. Some of the biggest natural disasters we've seen in recorded history have been caused by tsunamis, such as that Indian Ocean event that happened in 2004. An estimated almost four of a million people lost their lives during that event. Um, and then there's all the other effects, crop losses, destroy aquaculture, for example, um, if you've got shrimp beds or like a, a mussel um, farms, and it can have a huge impact on biodiversity and ecosystems. I'm just going to show you a few pictures illustrating that. So the, this is from the Indian Ocean event that affected uh, Indonesia and, and around that whole Indian Ocean. The, the, uh, the before image above just shows before that, not long before that event occurred, and below shows a huge amount of erosion that's occurred on that shoreline um, and the scouring, which has completely changed the way that shoreline looks. This shows the way in which you can have permanent flooding. These are low-lying agriculture areas which have been permanently flooded after, after that event. And this illustrates how it can affect forest cover and crops. So the, the salt water can quickly damage and kill um, crops in forested areas. So if you think of areas that have high value biodiversity, they may be changed for the good after a, a large tsunami. And this is just showing a few, illustrating a few impacts from the, the Japan Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. So a magnitude nine event waves up to 40 meters. Some of the largest we've seen in, in recorded history. You can see the amount of debris that flows through in these areas. And afterwards when the water drains, it's just left like a rubbish dump. And obviously the huge effect that it has on people's lives. This last image shows that the water coming in isn't nice and clean. As I've said, it picks up a lot of sediment, dirt, and that material is filthy. Um, and that creates um, a, lot, a change in density, which means that a lot of debris is a lot lighter than that water flow. This is from the Samoan tsunami that occurred in 2009, another very large earthquake, 8.1. Tsunami waves up to six to eight meters, had a huge effect on both American Samoa and Samoa. And this illustrates again that the debris that gets picked up, buses, cars, boats, um, shipping containers, and that acts like a battering ram on the infrastructure and leaves in its wake the, these type of images that we've seen from these events. So it's hugely destructive. So a few events that have affected our region, um, I mentioned the 1855 Wairarapa earthquake, that was one of the largest earthquakes to affect uh, New Zealand in, in recorded history. Um, the waves were reported to be about 10 metres high in Kawasa Bay. So this map here on the bottom right hand corner shows the Wairarapa and Wellington. So Kawasa Bay is that big bite at the bottom of the island and there's a black line in there, the Wairarapa Fault, I'm just showing it here with the, the pointer and that runs out into Cook Strait and and that ruptured on the seafloor, that moved the seafloor, and that's what pushed up that water column. It's also thought that there was a landslip that fell off the side of that canyon and enhanced the size of that wave. So there were two effects probably happening there. Um, and then there was a big earthquake in 1960 off the coast of Chile, which was the largest recorded earthquake ever in science, magnitude 9.5. Now the waves from that were about one metre in Wellington, 
around one and a half meters on the Wairarapa coast. Um, and that was, we were quite fortunate in that, that it arrived on a lowish tide. Um, there's a few pictures there, one from the Littleton dry docks with the river flowing over. And again, it was sort of lowish tide there as well, um, and Gisborne foreshore. There were um, students that were taken by their teachers down to the Christchurch Haven Hefty Estuary, if you're familiar with that area. Um, and that estuary filled up in four and a half minutes from low tide to about a metre above high tide. So they had quite a big effect on New Zealand. So about since 1848 for the Wellington region, we've had about four events over a metre, at least a further eight events over 0.3 of a metre. There was some of the biggest earthquake, uh, earthquake causing tsunami in New Zealand were, have occurred in Gisborne. And this was, there were two events in 1947 magnitude seven and a magnitude six and a half earthquake that produced waves of about 10 and six meters respectively. Um, and that caused quite a lot of damage. So we do get these events around New Zealand. And just a few other recent events, we've had quite a few in the last um, decade or two. We had a big earthquake in Fiordland in 2003. There was a landslip caused during that, which caused a four to five meter wave in Charles Sound um, and about a 0.3 meter wave in Jackson Bay. I mentioned the big 2004 Boxing Day tsunami, the Indian Ocean event. Um, and as I said, the wave for that was affected, uh, was first noticed and affecting New Zealand from the south. So in Jackson Bay, it was about 0.9 of a meter. In Timaru, it was over a meter. And in Wellington, it was about 0.25 of a meter. So it traveled up New Zealand from the south. I also mentioned the Solomon Island earthquake. This is a the bottom, the middle um, graph is a chart readout from the tide gauge in Wellington um, Harbour, and that shows the onset of that tsunami. And it actually got caught up in the harbour and refracted backwards and forwards in there, bouncing around every 20 minutes or so for about a day. Um, and that tide gauge shows that tsunami bouncing backwards and forwards in the harbour. When that happens, we often have warnings for uh, telling people to stay out of the water during these events. And what can happen is that you can get really strong currents, which mean that when you're swimming out there, um, it can be quite dangerous. Now, after the um, this event here, so there was a big event in 2010, again off the coast of Chile. We had a 0.3 metre wave um, that's squashed around the Wellington region. There were some gentlemen who were launching their boats off the off the Mana Marina, and this was about a day later, all of a sudden there was this current that swept in and a, a big wave swept up the boat ramp and um, caught them up in it. Um, and that was about a day later. And that was the same with the Kumdek event. There was uh, about a day later, some, also some boaties um, had recorded, uh, a, they had filmed the wave coming into the Foxton Mana Two estuary. So that energy can slosh around for a long time. And here's just a few pictures from that Chile tsunami. Wellington waterfront being flooded. There was a bore that ran into the Avon Hefty estuary. And just finally, some of the recent events, the Kaikoura earthquake, most of you will remember that. A huge sequence of earthquakes, which um, generated a tsunami, and part of that may have been from submarine land slipping. The first waves were registered along that, along the Kaikoura coast within about 10 minutes. Um, but it took quite some time before the largest waves arrived on shore, about 40 minutes. And this is another important message. The first tsunami wave is often not the biggest, it's often the second, third, or even fourth wave. So whilst the first waves might be on shore within a matter of 10 or 15 minutes locally, it can take some time before the biggest waves arrive, arrive on shore. So that's an important message to know to move out and that you do have time. In Wellington, the first waves um, arrived within 30 minutes. Um, and after about three hours, that the wave built to about 0.7 meters. Um, and there was widespread evacuation in the Hutt Valley, which was a really good result for us. And finally, um, just illustrating some of the complexity of these events. Now, the, the Kumanek earthquakes, actually each one of those big earthquakes caused tsunami that the first one was off the east cape with the second two off the kermadex so there were actually three tsunami 
sloshing around there and this made it very difficult for the modelers to try and predict where the largest waves were going to be, what time they were going to arrive. And there's two little screenshots here of a model that was run of the 8.1 earthquake, um, the largest and last one in that sequence, and it just shows you the complex interactions of that wave as it's bouncing around off the islands and interacting with the seabed. And all those little variations um, mean that along a coastline you can have a difference in height from one bay to the next. And that wraps up my talk for the moment, um, but I'm happy to take questions as well. Thank, thank you, Ian. I think that uh, your presentation really highlights the devastating impact that tsunamis actually can have. And uh, in the scheme of things, they're actually more frequent than probably most people realize uh, that, that broad history that you just outlined. So thank you very much for that. I do have That's one. right. They, they, they do occur a lot more regularly than what you would, would actually yeah. think. Yeah, and I think, I think that's, that's been illustrated. Uh, Mark Osborne asks, which New Zealand harbors are most at risk of tsunami? Um, the, some of the highest risk areas of New Zealand are on the east coast of the North Island, um, but also harbors south of that, for example, on Banks Peninsula. So some of those bays can channel the wave. So that in the Kaikoura earthquake, there's a, a, there's a bay on Banks Peninsula called Little Pigeon Bay, um, and that actually helped build the size of the tsunami and it destroyed a wee cottage um, that was on the shoreline there, and that built the wave up to around three metres inside that, in that little bay. So those, generally it's the east coast facing bays between about Christchurch all the way up to East Cape and um, Tauranga. I'll add that those receive the biggest waves frequently, but all of New Zealand's coast is at risk of tsunami yeah. and all of the harbours, um, and you can still get dangerous currents. So stay out of that water even if you're not expecting a larger wave. Thank you both. Great. Thank you very much. I'd like to now turn it over to Kate Borsing. As mentioned earlier, Kate is the project leader at East Coast Life at the Boundary, and she's going to share some stories from Japan and uh, what, she's, what her organization is doing with schools. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you all so very much to Remo for hosting um, this presentation today. So I've just got a bit of a slide show, so um, bear with me as I get myself sorted and do a bit of a screen share. Beautiful. So um, the presentation that I'm going to give today, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the Hikarangi subduction zone, our hazard, and give you a few examples of the good and the ugly um, when it comes to preparing for tsunami um, at schools, and also highlight a little bit about what we can do um, to help schools be prepared. So um, this is a very colourful picture of the Hikarangi subduction zone. So you can see the trench running offshore our east coast. So this is the physical boundary of our, our two tectonic plates, the Australian and the Pacific plate. And the Hikarangi subduction zone is responsible for our largest earthquake and tsunami um, in New Zealand. And so, as you can see, it's super close to the east coast of the North Island. Um, and so that means that when we feel that long or strong earthquake, um, we potentially, um, there's likely to be a tsunami um, from an event like that. So we know um, scientists have been studying the Hikarini subduction zone for the last decade or so, um, even longer than that. And we know um, from their research that have, there have been 10 large earthquakes in the late last 8,000 years. And some of these earthquakes have caused tsunamis. So we know that these events have happened in the past. And so this means that we know that they're gonna happen in the future. So it's really, really important that we are prepared um, for these events because we know that we are vulnerable to them. So the events um, that, that could be produced are something similar to the Japan 2011 earthquake. So you may remember um, some of the images um, from this dev devastating um, event. 
um, where around 18,000 people unfortunately um, lost their life. So that's why it's so important to remember that long or strong get gone message. So if you feel an earthquake that's longer than a minute or strong and it makes it difficult to stand up, um, that's your natural warning sign to evacuate. So I'm going to share with you a story and this story kind of gets me every single time I read it. Um, and it's a story about a school um, in Japan um, called Okawa Elementary School. So this school, um, they unfortunately, they had an emergency management plan, but they hadn't actually adapted it um, to their, their local context um, and they hadn't actually practiced it. And so um, the school, um, they evacuated because they felt that, that earthquake, but they just evacuated um, to a, on site to the school. And a lot of the parents ended up actually coming to the school and they were trying to tell the teachers and the, the principals to evacuate and they were actually told to calm down. Um, and so unfortunately, um, of, of the 75 children that were in the care of um, teachers um, at the time of the earthquake in Japan, all bar one of them from were from Okawa Elementary School. So around 74 children um, died from the school, school because they didn't evacuate on that natural warning sign and they hadn't practiced this before. So it's quite a horrible story, um, but it's one that we're really hoping to avoid here in New Zealand. And that's why we're so strong at promoting that long or strong get gone message and ensuring that schools um, right along the coast in tsunami evacuation zones um, know to practice um, their evacuation route and, um, and have a really solid emergency management plan. So when we're looking at emergency management plans, um, Remo does these really awesome workshops for schools and early learning services um, where, they can, where teachers and um, principals and board of trustees can go um, to um, improve their emergency management plans. But I guess one of the four kind of key things that I think um, are really important um, when we're looking at emergency management plans, um, not just for schools, but for us as well, it needs to be really easy to understand. So it's no point getting bogged down into the details. Um, and we also need to be flexible as well. So when you're thinking about um, creating your evacuation route, think about your location first. So where, so where you want to get to safety and identify your safe point and have multiple different routes um, to get to that location because we don't really know what will happen on their day. Um, there could be liquefaction, there could be trees down, um, there could be other sorts of damage. So it's important that we have different routes um, that we can take um, to get to our safe location. It's also really important that we think about, um, you know, the context of that school or early learning services. So what, what might work for one school might not work for another school. And it's the same for us in our personal plans as well. So it's really important that we kind of think about our own um, issues as well. Um, the other, and I think this is the main thing, and um, Graham's already highlighted this today, is it's really important that they are practiced. This is what saves lives um, and the muscle memory that kind of goes with that as well. Um, when you're thinking about your emergency management plan, um, think about the types of warnings that you'll receive. Um, so the, the event that we're really concerned about is that local source earthquake that Graham explained a little bit earlier. So that's that long or strong earthquake. For the events that come from further afield, like the um, distant source events from Chile, we know we're going to have a bit more time um, to actually do those evacuations. So when we're thinking about those warnings, we're thinking about those immediate actions that we need to take. So it's also really important that we detail um, how we're going to, um, how often we're going to practice our drills, um, potential supplies that we might need to take with us. Um, and if you're a school, how you're going to get, um, you know, students back with their families as well after an event. It's also really important that we think about people with special um, needs and requirements, for example, for those early learning services um, that might have children, um, babies in their care. It's important that we think about um, having food and nappies, et cetera, for them. It's also really important that we think about how we're going to communicate um, during and after an event 
Um, it's really important that parents know where your safe location is prior to an evacuation. So we don't have parents heading into a tsunami evacuation zone um, during an event because they, our parents um, have to be um, familiar um, so we avoid them coming into the tsunami evacuation zone. Another really important thing is that they Kate, we just lost you, it looks like. Give you a second to reset. Otherwise, we might have to come back and circle back with any key points at the end. So Kate looks frozen on the screen. This is always one of the risks of uh, doing anything technology-wise, but I do want to reiterate some of the great stuff she's talked about around planning for schools, um, having emergency management plans. That's a big part of what our team does, and I might close with some of those points just to hit that message home. Um, what I'm going to do is actually move on now to Caroline Dew. Caroline is the CEO of Alfero. Alfero is a software development company based here in Wellington. We've been working with Alfero for the past year and a half, actually, on the development of the Tsunami Ready app, which they have been developing um, for the region. And it is a really exciting uh, document, exciting app that, that uh, she's going to talk about. And I think it's a really engaging way um, for people to uh, think about what they need to do and know what their zone is. Hey, we're gonna come back to you in, an, in just a little bit, okay? If with any closing thoughts you might have. Caroline, the floor is yours. Might wanna unmute yourself. Caroline, you're muted right now. You might wanna unmute yourself. Okay, sorry. Um, I don't have slides. Um, I'm just going to give you a bit of background of the project and um, some of the insights that we've had since it was released. Um, so um, yeah, big thanks to Dan and the, the team from Remo for support for us um, getting to where we've got to. Um, so just a little bit of background around the project. Um, so we, we're a um, New Zealand digital agency. We've got offices in Wellington and Auckland, but the majority of our team are based in Wellington. And anybody who lives in Wellington has um, things like earthquakes at the front of mind. <laughs> Um, and um, we um, have an innovation program internally where the team get to kind of um, um, do kind of brainstorming and generate ideas around, you know, we'll kind of lob a problem or an opportunity statement at them and kind of go, how would you solve this? Or how could we, how could we tackle um, a, a problem or an opportunity? And um, sometimes they'll kind of come out with an idea that is not necessarily solving the problem that we asked them to, but actually is kind of interesting. So in this particular case, um, we um, had come out with a, a concept when we were doing um, some um, we were doing some brainstorming on some ideas of how to keep people better informed during major weather events. Um, Met Service is one of our clients, and one of the ideas that they came up with was um, was actually around um, a, around showing people the route to safety from a tsunami and. Um, where it started is the team originally having um, a concept of an app that would actually show them where to go during a tsunami. And um, the concept number one actually had a tsunami kind of stampeding up behind them. Um, that got kiboshed very quickly by our team internally who basically did, felt that it was not sensible to have a tool that was for use during a major, um, major event. Um, not least of which, you know, if cell phones, if cell towers are down and so on and, and people become reliant on it, it could, it could be dangerous. So, um, but where we thought that it had real potential was providing um, a better way for people to um, be aware of where their safe places are and how to get to safety and also for people to practice, um, to practice how to get to safety um, from the, the, the regular places that they go to. So we, um, we basically ran a, um, we, we ran this, decided to run this as an internal project, um, as, a, as a, a pro bono project for the Wellington region. Um, obviously based, being based in Wellington, it was easy. Um, and um, we reached out to Remo with our thinking about, you know, do you think this is a good idea? Um, got really positive um, feedback about it being, you know, potentially being, another useful tool to educate and inform people um, and also endorsement about the fact that it should really be um, something that's used to help people get prepared versus um, during an event. Um, and um, at a, you know, in terms of how we then 
designed um, designed the, the the product and built it. There were kind of two R and D streams. One of them was around the design side, um, and a lot of it goes to um, how to simplify the message to the user about what they need to do. And I think one of the things that we we grappled with the most was the that kind of balancing the um, the stop, drop, and hold for an earthquake with long, strong, get gone. And um, it feels like there's been a really, really good effort made to get people to understand what to do during an earthquake. But we, um, when we were doing research, which is very much backed up by um, by the team from Remo, um, there was often a perception from members of the public that they would get, you know, that there'd be a siren or they'd get a warning and they'd be told what to do. So part of what we were then looking at is how do we actually design the app so that people um, have a feeling of urgency about even getting prepared, um, and um, and then would be would use use the app to understand their safe places and to um, and to practice that drill. Um, there was a bunch of interesting technical challenges which I won't go into in detail, but a lot of it was around um, around handling the um, handling the the journey mapping with the GPS. So with the mapping, and if you think about a normal um, if you're using Google Maps and going, how long is it going to take me to get between, I don't know, um, your home and your work, it'll map out a route, route, a route for you, um, a route for you, and it'll tell you how long it's going to take. Um, the challenge with um, tsunami, with getting a, a safe place in a tsunami zone is that we actually have effectively one long line that kind of is a, a safe zone, and then you've got to kind of work out what the end point is that you're going to map to and that sounds a little bit complicated but um in a nutshell um that was where a lot of our our, our r d went to so um the um the product was launched um fairly recently and we partnered it with a website that um that is designed to kind of get the visceral message across around the importance of actually getting up and moving and why this is important um, and it's so far we've had we've had really good feedback. I mean, some of the feedback's been quite interesting. So what we're finding is we're getting contacted by businesses. So Capital Coast District Health Board actually wanted to promote it to all of their staff. And so we've had a number of larger organizations actually promote it to their staff. Um, we've also had um, members of the public do a drill and then either complain that it took them two minutes extra, or, <laughs> um, you know, so if, if Google says it's going to take, you know, if, if you know, because we're using the, the Google, um, you know, um, directions and mapping, if it says that it's going to take nine minutes and they do it in 12, there's kind of a level of outrage about, you know, the map is wrong, it took me longer. But that actually go, it actually just validates the point that one should actually practice. Um, the other thing that's been, um, Quite interesting is we've had um, we've had there have been quite a few people who said I they're using it to understand um, how to get to safety from places other than their home. So um, we had one person contact us and say, well, what I know now is that I need to sprint really really fast for the beehive because um, um, his office is based on the waterfront. And um, so I think that you know it's been it, it's been a really it's it's a really useful kind of education tool. Um, we're really hoping that more people will try it. And I think that the the feedback around the length, the, the drill time not necessarily, or the practice time not necessarily taking what people think it is, I think is really important. Um, and I think the other message that has been, uh, that has also started to get across to some of the users is whether they actually drive, because I drive or walk, um, so it's the importance of actually understanding how long it would take you to, 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 to walk or, you know, at least get somewhere on, get to safety on foot. Um, so, and yeah, so I think that, I mean, that's probably, you know, early feedback. It hasn't been, hasn't been in production too long, um, but definitely we're, we're, we're feeling pretty positive about where it's, where it's at right now. And, um, and what we're looking forward to is kind of enhancing it um, and improving um, improving it moving forward based on some of the feedback, which also does include people saying things like, you know, there's a particular set of stairs because this is Wellington that goes between these houses and I can cut up there. And so the 
Google Maps and Apple Maps are actually quite good. They have picked up on a lot of that stuff, but there's the odd one that's missed. But at least if people are getting out there and trying, it's actually achieved the purpose of, of getting them to practice. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, Caroline. And I just want to give everybody a little, because that's the view from my phone of what, uh, what the app looks like online. It's called the Tsunami Ready app. And I think what I really love about it is it's really quite interactive. Um, and you can, as Caroline was talking about, you can actually um, punch in a, quite a number of different addresses, family, friends, whether you work, where you live, where you play. Um, so it's really kind of quite uh, engaging to you can kind of go down the rabbit hole and punch in a whole bunch of different addresses just to yeah. see where those are in the zone. So um, thank you very much. It's been really great working with you and we're continuing. Uh, yeah, just one last comment. Um, yeah. Another bit of feedback that we've also had is people who've been quite surprised that the fastest route wasn't what, where they thought it was. Um, because often they'll assume that they have to go towards the nearest hill and sometimes they just need to move inland three blocks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think that, you know, that's why it, it is particularly useful. Yeah, and I think that really reiterates Kate's point earlier around having multiple routes. Um, so let me just turn it, thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, let me just turn it back over to Kate with any closing thoughts that uh, you might have missed out on now that uh, your computer is back online. Kate, did you have any uh, closing points that you wanted to share? Hi, um, thanks, Dan. I was just going to comment um, that it's really, really important, obviously, um, to evacuate immediately on feeling that long or strong earthquake, um, and really important that schools actually do practice it. And it might sound a bit overwhelming to kind of think about doing a full school evacuation. Um, so if you haven't done one before, what I definitely recommend is identifying your route first um, and then practicing it with just the staff. Um, and then potentially the next step after that is maybe doing it a classroom at a time um, before you actually do the entire school evacuation. Mm -hmm. And that kind of goes the same for early learning services as well. Um, so there's some really, really awesome examples throughout the country of schools that have, um, um, have practiced and have um, reviewed their emergency management plans regularly and they do their drill once or twice a year. Um, and But we also know that there's some schools that are in a bit of a tricky situation um, where it might be um, they're a little bit far from, um, you know, just from a safe location. Um, but it's really important that those schools still have those conversations with their community um, and still um, look at their routes and look at different options um, for, for um, evacuation. Um, I managed to do some work with this awesome school over um, in Washington State in the US, um, and they're in a really, really vulnerable um, position for tsunami, and they just knew that they weren't actually going to get to safety in time. Um, it's quite a poor community in this area, um, and so one of the things that they actually decided to do in their area is they um, taxed their um, community, and the community all voted to have an additional um, tax rate um, on their rates, and they funded a vertical evacuation um, hall in their school. So the new gymnasium um, where the kids went for their cafeteria for their food was actually strengthened and reinforced so that the, school, um, the kids at their school and also the surrounding community um, could use it as a vertical evacuation option um, during the event. So it's really important, like these are there are different options available, um, but it's also important to consider that these are, it is a journey. You don't just become a tsunami safe school. It's a process of working towards becoming tsunami safer. Um, so just a possible option um, there as well. Um, and just, just to touch on, um, I know some of you might not have children, um, but it is really important that you, if you do, um, if you do have children that you know their tsunami safe location, um, and you have a chat to the school about, about what their plan is, um, even if it is for, um, you know, earthquakes or fire, um, because it's really important that you do know what is planned there as well. Cool. Well, over to you, Dan. Thank you very much, Kate. I really appreciate that. Um, there's, there's, we we're going to talk a little bit more around some preparedness points. Uh, we do have quite a number of questions, and we've only got about nine minutes left. Um, I do want to hit one really important message in the Wellington region, which is we don't have tsunami sirens. It's something that we often get asked about. It's been touched on. Um, just reiterating that point that for the risks that we have when it comes to tsunami, the real big risk 
is that locally generated tsunami that would be generated by a big local earthquake. So if there is a big earthquake that is long or strong, long, which is longer than a minute, um, that's longer than Kaikoura earthquake for those of you that experience that, or strong enough to knock you down to your feet that you can't even stand up on it. That is the only warning you need and it's the only warning you're gonna get um, for immediately evacuating out of the coastal area to safer air, to safer ground. So um, I just wanna reiterate that one important message there. Um, as well as uh, take a moment as soon as it's done to download the Tsunami Ready app and go to our website at getprepared.nz. So a few questions as the trying to catch up on because we've had quite a number come through. Um, the first question I want to get to is from Rebecca Knott, who asks, what time frame in wave height can we expect in Lyle Bay in a near source earthquake? Um, I, I'm feeling a number of these could either be answered by Ian or Graham. Um, so Graham, you, ready? you seem ready to launch on that. Ian, correct me on the exact time frame. Um, I would say 10 to 15 minutes, but uh, I believe you got that close to the tip of your brain, right? Yeah, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, there is quite a, that big subduction zone, that Hikurangi subduction zone is quite long. So it would depend on what part of that yeah. actually uh, ruptured during an earthquake, but at its closest, and bearing in mind that it will have to funnel up into Cook Strait and it will move around, but 10 to 15 on average, some places maybe a bit sooner, some a bit later. And the key thing there is that's the first arrival. That doesn't mean it's going to be the largest. In Japan, it was second, third, or even fourth arrival that was the largest. That's, yep. that's right, yeah. Yeah. I'm, so that's why often when a, a evacuation notice is posted, um, it might be for quite a number of hours because it's not just one wave, it'll be a series of waves and it may take a number of hours for that to play out. And you asked about height. It is similar potentially to Japan in terms of that distance and the size of that subduction zone. So that number Ian quoted 35 or 40 meters elevation right at the coast on the steepest coast of land it is a credible number. And obviously over flat land, it drops off in there. But again, those evacuation zones allow for all of those different complexities. So just know your evacuation zones and have practice. And, and one thing that you've always said, Graham, that I've always liked, which is uh, every step away from the water yep. is a step away from the water, right? So every um, every meter counts because you, you don't know how big the tsunami is going to be and you don't know when the largest wave is going to arrive. So we're giving you the you know the, that fastest arrival, 10 to 15 minutes, but it might be coming from further away or the biggest wave may not be the first, quite possibly. And so it is so worth evacuating immediately. Yeah, uh, I, I know from communities I went to in Japan, the places where almost everybody survived were where they evacuated on the earthquake immediately without waiting for anything. The fatalities were in places where people waited around for a whole variety of reasons. One of them is actually in one of your other questions. I'll just grab that right now. Traffic jams. It's best to evacuate on foot or on a bike because you want to avoid the congestion that's guaranteed. The Japanese were unequivocal about that. In, in urban areas, the car for a tsunami that's coming fast is not the way to go. Don't use your car. Yeah, so that was a question by Louise Hardman. Thanks. Louise. And just adding to that as well, for people who are mobility impaired or challenged, um, it's important to allow them uh, leave the roads free for those people that can't do that, right. can't walk. So if you can, if you're able bodies, get on a bike, keep running, what it takes. And that's, and that's all part of having your plan, having where you're going to go, multiple evacuation pathways and I'm um, having a, if you need, you know, getaway kit ready to walk out of the house as well. Um, we've got another question uh, by Michael Ross. Again, I'll turn this over to Ian or Graham. Does Mo Michael Ross asks, does modeling on a Hikarangi subduction zone mega thrust earthquake attempt to take account of the effects of both the tsunami itself and the reasonably foreseeable effects of a mega thrust earthquake in terms of up thrust or down thrust Locks. Yeah, so Ian, you, you were leading uh, the development of those zones with our tsunami modelers. So uh, how, how did, what's, your, um, what's your summary there? So when we model, because we've done updated modeling uh, for the updated tsunami maps, they looked at 50 different rupture scenarios in the way in which that fault will move. Um, they looked at different segments that could break and the, and the rupture characteristics of that. So um, there were quite a number of different mechanisms and, and different scenarios that we went into modeling um, what potential wave sizes would be from that. Cool. 
And Eugene Doyle, hey Eugene, um, has asked how long does it take from the moment of a major earthquake? Have we run tests on uh, how long does it take from the moment of a major earthquake to activating a localized warning? So just re reiterating that point around it, if that can take tens of minutes to evaluate um, how big that earthquake was, where that earthquake was, which is why we really reinforce the only warning you're going to get and the only warning you need is an earthquake that is long or strong. I mean, with GeoNet supporting and of emergency management, they will follow up when they do have information to pass on, but do not wait for that information. The reason we have those sensors and we have that warning system is for the sources further away up towards Tonga or on the other side of the ocean where you might not feel the earthquake or it might not wake you up. But if you feel it and it's, um, and it's long or strong, you need to get gone. The only warning you need. Can't stress that enough. Um, looks like we have time for one more, two more, maybe. Um, Hennessy Wilson asks, how do I explain the threat of tsunami to my family so that they take it seriously? Kate, would you like to answer with that one? Oh, that's a bit of a difficult one. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it's really about understanding, for them understanding the risk and probably around the likelihood and experience explaining that these events have actually happened in the past. Um, it might have actually been a bit of a wake-up call that March um, the 5th one, if you guys felt that where you are, um, as a good reminder that these events do happen. Um, lucky for us, it was a bit of a smaller earthquake, um, so it meant we had a smaller size tsunami. Um, but it just goes to show that these events um, do happen and, and explain that, you know, if they are in a zone, it's important that, you know, you know that they're safe um, and you know that they've got the right actions um, to take from that long or strong earthquake. Um, so I think it's really about having a conversation and explaining um, your concern for them um, and explaining, you know, what our risks are. The, the psychologists we work with point out that there's a couple of real barriers there. And, and if you understand those, it can help the way you talk to people. So one is uh, whether people feel like their actions will make a difference. And so running through an exercise with the family, having a plan and running through it will make them, will help them to understand that actually I can make it in that amount of time. And that'll be the difference between life and death. It's, it's not a lost cause. And the other one is, is something they call normalization where they've seen a few tsunami in their lives, maybe if they're 20 or 30 years old, you've definitely seen the March 5th events and people are like, all right, well, they're all gonna be small like that. No, the, the large ones are infrequent, but they're the ones that you're evacuating for. And, Time is short when that happens. So just because you haven't seen one doesn't mean the big one can't happen. Just really reiterate, one of the reasons why we're so excited to partner with Alfaro is because that Tsunami Ready app is a really nice engagement tool to have these types of conversations in a measured and constructive way and a really quite an interesting way because once you start entering in addresses, it does really start to go, really prompts you to go like, well, what about my friends? What about my family? What about where I work? And then it can, you kind of show people how long it does take to get out of that zone in practice. So mm -hmm. yeah, just another really you know, important pitch for that. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and you can learn more of this as well to maybe structure that conversation by going on to our own website where we talk extensively about tsunami, tsunami risks for the region at getprepared.nz. Um, so with that, it is right on the nose one hour. I just wanna thank all of our panelists uh, for taking the time in the evening um, to come join us for this conversation. It's been really fantastic, um, enlightening, very visual, good conversations. And uh, thank you those who have signed in as well, taking the time. I hope this has been beneficial. We'd certainly appreciate any feedback because we're interested in doing more of these types of events in the future where we bring experts together and you know just basically help people understand what um, those risks are and what are the steps they can do to be better prepared. So with that, Thank you all very much for this uh, event and the point where you say we're signing off. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs>